Welcome to worship, everyone. Hello, Zoomers. Uh, oh, one thing that I keep forgetting, but I won't, it, it's important to remember, anyone who's not a member of the church and would like to become a member, come on down. We're always open and would love to have you become a member or an affiliate member. An affiliate member is sort of like having dual citizenship. You know, you can have it in two countries. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> uh, Kathy Decker suggested yesterday that we think about how the church might mobilize in case this hurricane uh, hits us. I think that's a good idea. Let's have a little conversation about that after church. There's coffee cake, raspberry, Entelman's raspberry coffee cake, my favorite, back here with coffee. So wherever we want to meet. Lots of announcements. The annual school supply drive for Tillman School is ending today. Be hard to, to bring supplies. But if you want to make a monetary contribution, that'd be great. Please make a note that your contribution is for school supplies. Community garden. Patty's Brussels sprouts are getting lonely out there. We're advised that uh, gardeners can begin planting this week after Ian passes. So next Saturday, Max, our extension agent, will be out there. Not, oh, Mac. Oh, even better. Joan will be there telling us, no, I better, better shut my mouth. Jeff knows what I was going to say. Okay, next Saturday, we're going to do some planting. Any time, Joan? Joan, you got a time for us? Uh, yeah, I'll get there at 8, 8.30. 8, 8.30. Thank you. Come any time. Uh, we have a Spiritual Journey book club starting on October the 10th. And that'll be taught by Mary Boss. Uh, it's a story of women, particularly in the Bible. I am told that they will not shut the doors if any man happens to be interested in that. Right, Mary? <laughs> I won't say. Uh, that group is limited to 12 people, and it'll meet on Mondays at from 1 to 2.30. Our 10th Avenue thrift store needs volunteers. The regulars are doing a terrific job there. Uh, we need some additional folks. If you've got a three or four hour time block on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, please let me know or please let Lorna know. Meals for the homeless. We continue to prepare 13 meals each week. Uh, we can always use the following items, fresh fruits, brownie mixes, cookies of any kind, frozen garlic bread, hamburger buns. Uh, those can just be left in the freezer back here in the kitchen or on the kitchen counter. Uh, menus for the week are posted back there. Am I, get, am I getting a yes or a no on that? For the month. Thank you. <laughs> At least I asked the questions, folks. The Head Start Migrant Center, uh, we're still collecting non-perishable food items for them. And I would love to see folks from over there getting more involved in our garden as well. Our next session meeting is scheduled for October the 4th. 
And I'm told that uh, Milana Shrugs, our executive presbyter, will be there for a bit of that time. Pastor nominating committee. Uh, we elected Jan Baxter, Karen Fawcett, Brian Voigt, Don Decker, Jeff Bryden, Hazel Hawansky, Steve Bradenton. I'm understanding that Steve may well be back next week uh, to be part of the pastor nominating committee. So if you have suggestions, be sure to reach out to that group. Uh, we'll begin that work formally as soon as our mission statement is approved. Are there other announcements or questions about those announcements? Ah, yes. If anybody has a, a grandkid or someone who's young enough to know how to run a sound booth, we would love to have you uh, learn. Dale and Barbara are good teachers there. Jeff. Ah, yes, the book study group has a handout at the door. I believe there's still some Tillman Supply handouts there too, even though they may be a little late there. As forgiven people, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Okay, in case you haven't greeted someone, please uh, greet them. You can, you can stand up and move around if you want to or however you want to do it. Glad you made it back, brother. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Now, you know that's the hook of horns. I can't. Good morning, my dear. Hey, good to see you. How are you, Mary? Good. Did you find it? I did. Are you gone? Just He went back in the restaurant. Which light? Oh. Barbara's son.
We continue our worship of God this morning with our prayer of confession. Put it in your bulletins. We pray in unison. We are surrounded by a truckload of temptations, Lord. It is difficult not to be seduced into following one or two of them and to forget to let your path guide our choices. We can become overly concerned about finances or anxious about whether our money will run out or whether we have friends left. We worry about many things. And we remember that you told us that worrying wouldn't add an inch to our height. Save us, we pray, from worrying about our future and feeling that we have to secure it by ourselves. Forgive us for not trusting in you. And together, Jesus Christ came to save sinners such as us. Your sins are forgiven. Live in the security of God's love. Our first hymn is Come Christians Join to Sing. Let's stand as we sing. Please remain standing for the affirmation of our faith. This is from a brief statement of faith found in the book of confessions of the Presbyterian Church. In life and in death, we belong to the God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in one triune God the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. Amen. Please be seated. It's usually my custom to read scripture in the middle or towards the beginning of a sermon, 
but after the sermon begins. So don't be too startled, but I'm going to read the scripture now. This is the word of God, and it is found in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Listen for what God has to say to you. There was once a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted scrumptiously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime, you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God. Thank you. Seems to me that in the story we just read, the sin of the rich man begins here. He did not see Lazarus. At best, he saw him as no more than an extension of his holdings, someone who was a nuisance at his gate, an ugly distraction from his own needs. At the end of the parable, when he asked the healed and transfigured Lazarus to do some errands for him, it is still clear that the once rich man didn't even see Lazarus then. Now, if he'd seen him for all that he was, once an infant son and then a boy, perhaps a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, if he had seen as someone with hopes and dreams, disappointments, and sadnesses, if he'd seen him as one beloved of God, then the story might have ended quite differently. Only it appears that though their paths crossed every day, and maybe sometimes twice or three times a day, the rich man just never saw Lazarus at all. Luke, these last five weeks, has had us thinking about faith and socioeconomic realities. You remember the banquet 
where the lowly went up to the exalted places and got moved down, and the exalted went to the lower pews and got moved up. You remember Jesus telling us to throw a banquet for the poor and the crippled. You remember the lost coin. Earlier in his account of the good news, Luke introduces us to the prodigal son who squandered his inheritance. Then there is the infamous story of the steward, the dishonest steward who was fired and he went out and cut the debts of all his master's creditors. Again and again, Luke focuses on wealth. And this week we have another story about money. I hear this story and I'm deeply aware that it speaks to me. No, I'm, I'm not Lazarus. I'm much more like that rich man. At the same time, however, I know that there have been instances where I have not been seen as well. My gifts, my talents, my brilliant solutions and fabulous insights have been ignored. How could that be? When I'm not seen, I usually do something to make myself seen even if it's stupid, and I'll do that in the pulpit, as you know. Let me tell you a story. My driving route to St. Paul went by a QT station where I would get gas and maybe coffee. The gas was a little bit cheaper there. Early in the morning, you could find a really diverse group of people there. First, there were the police, and I assumed at least that this was a pretty high-risk neighborhood for the police always to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. Then there are a lot of people in beat-up cars. They were heading to or returning from a long shift. There were any number of people who were derelicts or maybe prostitutes, people who looked like they'd slept in the open or had not slept at all. All of us were moving in and out of this QT, getting whatever business we had to do done, moving pretty fast, getting what we came for. And there in the middle of the store, maybe five feet in from the front, there was this woman dressed in a worn out sweater and nondescript skirt. And she sort of slumped there and her shoes had clearly seen better days and she just sort of stared straight ahead not reacting to anything. In my mind, I called her the gray lady. No one looked at her. Everyone just moved around her. She was not seen. We did not take notice of her. It's almost inconceivable that she was anyone's daughter or mother or sister. I'll admit, I didn't like seeing the gray lady. I'd prefer not to. I tried to distance myself from her, step around her like everybody else. As I thought her about her this week, she was my Lazarus, sitting at the gate with the dogs licking his wounds. And I was the rich man who ignored her who failed even to see her. Take a moment to think about who's the Lazarus in your life? Is she that quiet neighbor who never has any company? Is he the friend who has dementia? The cousin you heard was addicted 
or maybe even the rich man who is very lonely and isolated. There are three characters in this parable. One is Lazarus, who befits his poverty and his rags is sort of off to the side. He stays out of the rich man's way. Well, when he dies, he goes up to heaven. He is snuggled into the bosom of Abraham, surely the most prestigious and comfortable place there is. And the rich man goes to hell. That rich man looks up and he sees Lazarus and Abraham. He says, hey, Abraham, I'm dying here. Have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his finger into the water and just touch, touch the tip of my tongue. This is painful. Abraham looks over, says, child, you remember you had all those good things in this life and Lazarus had Zippo. Now Lazarus has the good things and you have agony. I'm sorry, but there's a huge chasm between you and us and no one can pass over it. The rich man sees the chasm and he responds, then Father Abraham, at least send Lazarus to my father's house. I got five brothers over there to warn them about what could happen to them so they could escape this hell. Abraham says, sorry, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. In a final Hail Mary effort to save his siblings, the rich man says, but they won't, Father Abraham. They won't listen to Moses and the prophets. Yet if somebody goes to them from the dead, they will repent. I'm pretty sure. Then Abraham says, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they won't listen to anyone, not even if someone rises from the dead. So there's more than a little irony here. Even Jesus' rising from the dead might not have convinced the brothers of the need to change, to see the Lazaruses of this world. So let's try to get into that, into the feelings of seeing and being seen. Have you ever felt that you weren't seen or heard? Try to remember that. I suspect most of us have that feeling sometime or other. What does it feel like? Does it feel like your voice has been stifled? And then who all of the people that you haven't seen? We've trained ourselves, I think, to see circumstances that might inconvenience us. I learned not to see that gray lady. Looking back at it, I'm sure she was asking for help. I bet that you remember times when you haven't seen or be, been seen. You are unwanted, ignored, treated like chopped liver. Having said that, I suppose it's pretty clear that the chasm in this parable uh, describes a lot of our situations. Even in hell, the rich man doesn't get it. He treats Lazarus like an errand boy. 
You know, get me a drop of water. Go warn my brothers. Could the parable have turned out differently? Are we the brothers and sisters of the rich man listening to the one who rose from the dead? Have we allowed the law of Moses and the prophets to help us hear the one who rose from the dead? Well, at least some of the time we seem to have. We've really heard this parable. We gather together to worship the one who rose from the dead. We're there with the drop of water, with the clothes for the naked, with the food for the hungry. We're offering others the chance to grow their own school supplies for children in need. We're responding to some needs, but many may go unaddressed. Some of those aren't material. A lot of those are people's need for friendship, to be heard, for openness, for the deep knowledge that God cares for them and that, that we are God's representatives in caring. That's all true, even for us who are relatively comfortable. So God is rewriting the ending of this parable. We are his messengers. We have the ability to hear this warning and to pass it along with compassionate companionship. We are among those who have seen the one raised from the dead. And in his name, we're committed to sharing water love, and good news with all those in need, rich and poor alike. So we act not out of fear that we will wind up in hell like the rich man. We act out of an encounter with Christ that enables us to see, to really see those in need of our compassion in our midst whether they be here worshiping with us, sitting back home in private despair, or at the park looking for a handout. Our responsibilities to one another are clear. We're called to see all those in need in our midst. How best to respond those in need is not always clear, but the calling to try is unmistakable. In the name of Christ, we need to see Lazarus. And then we need to take seriously his situation and act. God help us. Let us pray. Almighty God, we can imagine Lazarus we can imagine ourselves not seeing him. We are so glad that you have seen each one of us and that you have persuaded us that we are in fact your children and we don't have to worry about hell. Help us to be your people indeed, to reach out to Lazarus and to all those who perhaps need more than food and shelter, who need friendship, who need our understanding. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We respond to God with our morning tithes and offerings at this time.
with these morning offerings, God, we offer ourselves. Use us. Help us to be your ambassadors, your emissaries. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. I think I'll start at the back today. <laughs> okay, this is the time when we share our concerns with one another, and I'll mention them in our corporate prayer. So I'm collecting any concerns that, that you might have. For Tammy, right? What sort of cancer does she have? She didn't say she had a biopsy okay. or some kidney and stone type of treatment. Thank you, Dorothy. Pray for Marilyn. She's a lady in our park and she just had a drill in her daughter in law and uh, in an assisted living at home. Not doing so well. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay. Janet, I've got a phrase. Uh, I had my brief hospitalization this week and got out on Thursday and I um, seem to be fine. Everything's looking good so far. Sure, thank you. Yes, Lorna. I couldn't hear. Donna Thorne. Donna Thorne. She's ill. Okay. Patty? I want to pray for our neighbor who's wrestling with alcoholism. Okay. Something else, Shannon? I think yes. We, I think we should pray for the people in Ukraine and also we hope that this storm that was flourishing out there doesn't hit us. It's going to go off somewhere else. That's, that's a dangerous prayer. Is that sort of like, <laughs> God, let that storm hurt some other people? <laughs> Denise? Oh, your niece. I thought you said Denise. <laughs> Okay, last call. Mary. Our friend Charlie, his wife died on Thursday. He's lost. Yeah, I bet. Thank you. <laughs> I saw Barbara going like this. I thought she was trying to close her mouth. I shouldn't say things like that. <sighs> Let's pray. Open our eyes, Lord, open our eyes. Give us keen vision that we may see the needs of this world. We know that many of those needs are material, food, shelter, clothing, money, but many go beyond that. We all need your word and your path. Give us the strength not only to observe the spiritual needs of our neighbors, but to enter into their needs. We suspect that we will be enriched in that way. Assist us to enjoy the life of Palmetto Presbyterian Church and not only work in it. Teach us to love our neighbors in this church 
and in this community. We praise you for Brand's brief stay in the hospital, for Karen's niece who had a baby making her an honorary grandmother. I think I got that right. We pray for all those who are in the path of tropical storm Ian, for those in Puerto Rico and the Canadian provinces who got lashed by Fiona. Show us how we can be a sanctuary. Lord, please bring a safe termination to the Ukrainian-Russian war, a just and sustainable peace. We thank you for those who've recovered this week, for hospitals and good medicine. For all those who need our prayers, we pray. For those who are wrestling with alcoholism, for protection from the storm, we pray for Tammy with cancer, for Marilyn, for Christine Wall, for Donnie Thorn, We pray for all those who stand in need of your comfort and prayer. Finally, Lord, teach us how to enjoy our lives, to live with gratitude and appreciation, to recognize that God intends to delight us. For all this and so much more, we ask. We come to you in the name of him who died and rose for us, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 665, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Let us stand as we sing. And let us say the benediction for each other. It's found in the bulletin. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. 
God has a purpose in our being there. Christ, who dwells within us, has something he wants to do through us where we are. Believe this and go in the joy of God's power and love and grace. Before the prelude, I'm hoping that, no, maybe we'll do it after the prelude. Sorry, Carrie. <coughs> Please stick around for a brief conversation of how we might respond in case we get a direct hit from Ian. Okay? Thanks. Very nice.